in the United Nations General Assembly, um, the Georgians always voted to condemn the Russian aggression in Ukraine. So um, they're, they're in no way getting closer diplomatically um, um, to the Russians, but they're getting more and more dependent from the EU and from the NATO states, interestingly more, more to China, but also to Turkey and the regional partners. And that's why there is kind of this fear maybe in some Western capitals, well, we cannot control them anymore. They are not linked to us uh, anymore. And that's why we just um, frame it as, well, they're moving to Russia and we need to save them. And that plays into the cards of the new conservatives and of the nationalists like Saakashvili who want to overthrow the government and um, yeah, take another course. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I'm talking again to Dr. David Noack, who is a German historian. He wrote his PhD dissertation about the second tournament of shadows in Central Asia. And he's also a great expert on Eastern Europe. He reads and speaks Russian and has observed the political processes in the states of the former Soviet Union for over a decade. David agreed to update us today about political developments in Moldova and Georgia. So let's pick his brain. David. Welcome back. Hello, welcome. And one comment, I'm still not a doctor. It uh, still uh, is a work in progress. And uh, I hope at, that at the end of the year, I'm going to be a doctor. But um, so far, I'm still a master. I, I'm sorry, I thought you had received your, your, your PhD by now because you've submitted the thesis like years ago and you, you defended yeah. half a year ago or a year ago? Uh, two years ago. I defended two years ago, um, but I'm going to be a doctor at the end of the year, finally. It takes some time. <laughs> Academia yes. can take forever, everybody. Think yes. about it well if you want to do it or not. It can take forever. But, you know, he wrote a great dissertation. I also have, we, we did a conversation about uh, your dissertation about a year ago. I'll link it in the description so people can look it up. It's very interesting how you worked out the the the, the, the political situation in Central Asia um, around the 1910s and 20s. Yeah, right. starting in 1919 and ending in 1933. Yeah, so. yeah it's very beautiful. Yeah. Um, okay, but let's go to our main topic, and the one that I'm interested most in is actually Georgia. So you are a German uh, citizen, and I will have a Georgian uh, um, commentator in a week or two here on the program to talk oh. about this. But but you've been looking at the region for a long time, and right now what we are seeing is these big demonstrations against a foreign agent law, which in Western media is portrayed as a pro-Putin law, a pro-Russia uh, law, because it's reminiscent to a law that also the Russians have on their books. But the weird thing is the Americans have a law that, that requires uh, organizations to register, that lobby for foreign groups. And the European Union has a directive that's about to come out to this effect. David, why is it that this... Georgian law is being criticized so heavily, and who are the people who are protesting against it? Yes, first of all, there are many people protesting against it because there is a lot of disinformation there, and people think it's about the EU accession in general or the Euro Atlantic integration in general. But um, um, the most um, enthusiastic people are, yeah, the non governmental organizations themselves, and within those NGOs, there is a sm small set of NGOs in which um, former government ministers from Saakashvili's time um, are active and they want to overthrow the, the government. They want to come back. That's their avenue to use these NGOs, um, talk about the government that it's not legitimate and try to overthrow the government. And they are mostly funded um, by some donors from NATO states. We don't know who funds them but there are um, over 90% funded uh, from Western countries or from actors in Western countries. We don't know. It's, sometimes it's uh, Republican donors in the United States. So it's not even the government in the United States. It's just rich people with some neoconservative views in the United States fund these NGOs and they want to overthrow the government. And that's why the government said, well, we cannot allow this anymore. We need to have some rules here. First, um, they tried to introduce the foreign agents law um, last year, and there was a lot of protests on the streets, and they um, didn't take it into the parliament. And they and the Georgian government um, negotiated with Western embassies in Georgia um, about those donors and about the NGOs that are acting quite aggressively um, within Georgia uh, against the government. And 
um, then they negotiated and some of the Western diplomats, it looks like, were um, okay with that. And they said, yeah, we need some rules. We cannot allow this um, delegitimization of the government anymore. And we need some rules. But other um, embassies, um, yeah, weren't keen on that. And they, they yeah, let the negotiations blew, um, blow over. And um, yeah, that's why there is the second attempt by the Georgian government, because they say we, we need some some new rules here because there are um, NGOs like the shame movement, a uh, shame because um, they are not getting um, um, fast enough into the European Union. That's why the shame um, and other NGOs. And uh, if you look at the at the personnel at the top of those NGOs, um, yeah, they are from the for, former Saakashvili government. And there was one thing, I think it was um, three years ago, um, they led some demonstrations against the government and uh, then they proposed, well, we could um, have a caretaker government. You just resign, then we have a caretaker government, and we have a lot of the NGOs who could fill those posts in the caretaker government. So they proposed themselves as the new government. And yeah, the, the ruling government just said, no, no, thanks. And the interesting part also is when you look at the polls, there are many claims about which polls are serious, which polls are not serious. But when you look at the polls, the ruling um, party of the Georgian dream, they poll at about 40 to 60 percent in the electorate. So the, the neocons or the neoliberals and nationalists um, unified in the United National Movement by Saakashvili, they poll at about 10 to 50, maybe 20 percent. And the, the, the government is far ahead. So during uh, through elections, they have no avenue to get back into government. That's why they have this idea to um, yeah, to take some NGOs funded by Western partners. So it's not about, I don't know, caring about corruption or animal shelters or unions in Georgia themselves. No, they only care about the government. They want to get rid of the government. And that's their path um, to, um, yeah, to stage themselves as the civil society and then, yeah, get back into government and even force themselves for caretaking of it. It's just so ridiculous. And that's why the Georgian government, yeah, tries to to make a break here. It's not, it does not mean that it's good what they propose. I mean, this, um, the the role model for this um, act or for this um, law is the Foreign Agents Registration Act in the United States. Um, but yeah, then there was the Russian example, also other examples in Abkhazia, in Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan, that are more authoritarian. And that's why they don't know, well, will it be more like the American law or will it in practice be more like um, yeah, some in authoritarian or semi-authoritarian states? And because it's so vague and the rule, how they have written it, um, it's just not clear. And there is some kind of fear that through this law, um, yeah, the, the government could take an authoritarian turn. Um, yeah, but we don't know yet. And if we only listen to um, Saakashvili's um, former ministers, well, we don't get any objective news about that. That's for sure. Yeah. And maybe to make this clear, Georgia is a multi-party system um, with more or less representative parliament, right? Which is very different from the system we have in the US or the UK, where you basically, because you vote by majority, you end up with two-party system. Uh, Georgia has a multi-party system. So 40% for one party is a huge, huge majority. Um, currently, 40% um, is not enough, though, to be an absolute majority, which you need in parliament to pass a lot of these laws. Who is Georgian Dream currently in coalition with in order to have the majority needed to pass this law? No, currently they have the majority They they um, because they adopted some um, on the election law. So currently um, they have the majority, but there are even some smaller parties um, allied with them. There was um, the small Social Democratic Party, European Socialists, and they supported the law. And then there was a, like a sovereignist, or uh, in the old Gaullist sense, a sovereignist party um, that supported the law as well. And the Saakashvili former party, they even split. So there are uh, several parties, but the Georgian Dream has the majority for themselves. So they don't, they don't need any coalition part partner currently. And... In October or in autumn, um, in fall, sorry, in fall, we will have um, normal election, not snap elections, just regular elections. So um, we could just wait. Well, how does it turn out? Because last time um, the nationalists under Saakashvili, they lost and they even 
question the legitimacy of the election. And then the EU ambassadors in the country had to negotiate between opposition and government. And uh, then this impasse was, um, yeah, was resolved. Um, but um, if we can trust the, the recent polls, the Georgian dream will get um, a majority as well, because they are, even if they are only at 40%, if the second largest party is at um, 20% and then the others are at 5 to 10 then there's the threshold. So you don't even need a majority of all the votes, just of all the um, yeah, parliamentary or of the parties that make it over the threshold. So um, according to the polls, they will win again and then they can continue to govern. And we, yeah, we have to look how the elections turn out, if there's any meddling in, in the law, in the election law or in the conduct of the election or in the counting. Um, but um, yeah, we, we don't know yet. We have, we have to look and out for that. And the people who who keep emphasizing that this is a pro-Russian law and that Georgia is turning pro-Russian, they seem to ignore the fact that Russia and Georgia, up to this day, still don't have diplomatic relations with each other, right? They're both represented by Switzerland in order to have diplomatic relations. So um, can you interpret this in any other way than an attempt um, by these NGOs and Western influencers to, tr to try to break to break the political course of the country, which came away a lot from the course it was on under Saakashvili, um, which was basically the same course as, as Ukraine, right? Georgia was the first, was a, was was on on a, on a direct on a way to direct confrontation, had a direct confrontation, had a war with Russia, but that stopped and froze. And we've seen, and in this discussion I had with my other colleague. Uh, um, a couple of months ago, we we established very clearly, you know, that's the moment when when also a, a big part of the population of Georgia decided to change course and go toward uh, living together with Russia, even if you don't like them, um, rather than antagonizing them and becoming a next staging ground for a proxy war. Yes. So um, let's start with two, 2008. So there was the attack of the Georgian forces on South Ossetia because they wanted to cut off the Rook Tunnel in southern, uh, yeah, the northernmost tip of South Ossetia and want to cut off the supply line of the Russian and then conquer the territory. But then the Russians moved in and they, um, yeah, they, um, uh, well, they defended the South uh, Ossetian territory and even moved in into the, the Georgian territory. And then the, the Russian government recognized the independence of South Ossetia and Abkhazia and um, since then, there are no diplomatic uh, relations between Georgia and Russia. There are some contacts by um, special representatives, most often in Prague, interestingly, but they meet on neutral ground and discuss some issues like um, recently um, direct flights were re-established. And sometimes there are some trade issues because Armenia, which is part of the Eurasian Economic Union, that's south of Georgia. And Georgia agreed on, yeah, you can um, transport your goods through Georgia to Russia. We don't have a problem with that. But the problem is there are only three um, routes that these goods could take and the on land. And the first one is the Georgian military highway, which is sometimes blocked due to um, rocks um, um, coming down the, the mountains and then blocking the road. The second road is through South, South Ossetia, so there should be some kind of modus vivendi, modus vivendi but um, until now there isn't one. And the third route is um, through Abkhazia, so the other um, independent state-led or de facto state. So um, that's why Georgia and Russia don't have any relations anymore. But um, since the Georgian dream came into government more than a decade ago, there has some uh, some re, re Rapprochement, you could say some small rapprochement. There were small steps like now the direct flights again, and um, you can, and more and more Georgian workers went to, to Russia to work there as mi migrant workers because uh, after the Euro crisis in the EU, uh, most of the Georgian workers who worked in Greece, um, they were expulsed or they uh, went back and then they had to search for other jobs and then they went to Russia because it's yeah closer and um, they are. The regulations were um, um, lessened, so they so they could migrate there. So there is more interaction, and in the last decade, um, the Georgian trade also moved from trading almost exclusively with Turkey and other NATO and EU states, um, more to 
the regional partners, so Armenia, Azerbaijan, but also to Russia and to China. And China is um, one of the largest um, import and export partners. So Georgia is getting more and more economically independent from Europe or from the EU, from the NATO states. And um, But they're not mo moving towards Russia. I mean, the, the trade um, strengthened between those states, but they still have no diplomatic relations. The Georgian government still has a propaganda campaign that 20% of the territory is um, occupied by Russian troops, which just um, uh, yeah, ignores the Georgian factor in these um, de facto state conflicts and uh, just says, well, we don't have to do anything with them and it's just Russian occupied and they just have to move out and then these conflicts are solved. And these are conflicts that began 34 years, 35 years ago. Sometimes they have precursors um, going back a century. So um, that's just a, a ridiculous propaganda campaign. And uh, in the United Nations General Assembly, um, the Georgians always voted to condemn the Russian aggression in Ukraine. So um, they're, they're in no way getting closer diplomatically um, um, to the Russians, but they're getting more and more dependent from the EU and from the NATO states. Interestingly, more, more to China, but also to Turkey and the regional partners. And that's why there is kind of this fear maybe in some Western capitals as well. We cannot control them anymore. They are not linked to us uh, anymore. And that's why we just um, frame it as, well, they're moving to Russia and we need to save them. And that plays into the cards of the new conservatives and of the nationalists like Saakashvili who want to overthrow the government and um, you know, take another course. It's just, again, such an incredibly dumb good versus evil narrative that is coming down on us, raining down on us here. But that is, I mean, it has so many glaring faults uh, that I just I just wonder if it's even less believable for Georgia than it is for Ukraine. Um, the thing for me that's fascinating, and I need to tell you, everybody, uh, David wrote a chapter in one of, of the books that I edited uh, in 2017-18, I believe, where you picked apart, you know, the neutralist tendencies in several countries, uh, Turkmenistan, Moldova, and and Ukraine. And your, your verdict on Ukra Ukraine was very straightforward. It has been oscillating between more neutralist moments and less neutralist moments, less neutralist, always pro-EU moments or pro-Western moments. And we've seen where this oscillated into, um, away from neutrality. And we've also learned by now that the people who made Ukrainian neutrality impossible was not the Russians. It was NATO that, that sa sank that boat, which would have saved Ukraine as a, uh, well, uh, Ukraine, peace in Ukraine. And I am worried that so what we are seeing in Georgia is the same, right? It's not it's not going toward Russia. It's just going towards more independence and more neutralism in a, in the sense of being being less tethered to one of the blocks. And that this seems to be something that that the NATO countries and the West generally opposes and now tries to influence. And one of the strings of influence is through these NGOs. And this is what Parliament tries to work against. Is that about correct? Yeah, that's that's about correct. And the interesting part about um, the Ukraine war, since we already talked about that, is um, Georgia didn't adapt the EU um, sanctions on 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 Russia or uh, t towards Russia, and that's why Georgia became kind of a gateway for exports from the EU that first move into Georgia and then move into Russia. So it's just a, a profit strategy. It's just a niche on the world market because Georgia doesn't have any industry anymore. They have the migrant workers. They're kind of the largest market for used cars. So uh, many European cars get exported to Georgia, then they're picked apart and then parts of them are re-exported, which doesn't seem like a substantial or like a catch-up industrial <laughs> way to go. And um, so this neutrality in this war, just in this war, so they're not speaking about neutrality in a Turkmenistan, uh, in a Turkmen or in a Moldovan way, um, but, but just their practical neutrality in this issue um, just as a way to to for the state of yeah for the state or for for the ruling class um, uh, to to profit for for the businessman in Georgia to profit, um, yeah. But even this neutrality is seen that you're close to the enemy. How can you be neutral in an issue like the Ukrainian war? And you must be close to Russia. But um, yeah, that ignores a lot of facts within Georgia and the Georgian Dream Party. They're not interested in getting close to Russia. I mean, Ivanishvili, the the oligarch um, kind of the 
the man behind the Georgia Dream Party and the honorary president, and he just returned to politics. Um, he made his money in the 90s in Russia, but then Putin came to power and um, had uh, imposed a strict rule on the local oligarchs, and then Ivanishvili Ivan left the country. So he was not close to Putin, he just got out of the country, moved back to Georgia. I think he even became a French citizen and uh, moved his, his wealth to Western European states. And then after Saakashvili turned authoritarian late in his rule, he also turned on him and then um, yeah, entered politics uh, about a dozen years ago. Uh, years ago. And the interesting part about the sanctions is that part of um, Ivanishvili's wealth in Switzerland um, is blocked. So he cannot, uh, he doesn't have access to his wealth in Switzerland anymore. I don't know why. There is uh, only scarce information about that in the public sphere. Um, I don't know what kind of backroom deals they have or what they told him why they blocked his wealth. I don't know if the Swiss government considers him to be a Russian asset or something like that. Um, but yeah, that doesn't help, especially the EU cause, to get uh, Georgia closer to them if in Switzerland. I know it's not a EU country, but it's um, in this um, greater Wait, downstream uh, economic... EU. <laughs> We're a downstream EU country, so well, it's you okay. are associated more or less. Uh, yeah, we are. We are. We are. We are associated with the EU, and if you park your money there, you mostly do it because you don't want, I don't know, taxes of your home country um, uh, imposed on them. Um, and he did that, just like many German oligarchs did as well. Um, and now he doesn't have access to that wealth. I mean, he's an oligarch. I, I'm a left guy, so I'm I'm just for mm -hmm. appropriating the, the oligarchs, but that's not. A social issue in Georgia now that's some kind of interstate issue and that yeah. helps to yeah, alienate the Georgian government because they say well you impose sanctions on us why should we impose sanctions on other countries that we will suffer from yeah. like this yeah. Um, yeah, trade with Russia and Ivanishvili is the current prime minister so the... no no he's he's the man behind the Georgian dream ah. he doesn't have any um, um, any official government post, but he founded the party first. First, it was a coalition party. Now it's a party, and he's kind of the strong man uh, in the country. Um, but there is a new prime minister. He's just in office for um, several months. Um, I just forgot his name. I, I have his face uh, um, in mind, but I cannot um, think of his name. Yeah, well, something, uh, something, Billy, really, right? <laughs> Most. Uh, um, mostly it's something like that. Um, ah, no, it's Irakli Kobashitze. So oh. just a new guy. And the interesting part, he came into office in February and he said, well, our, the priorities of our government are first, a strategic partnership with the EU and second, a strategic partnership with China. So that was on equal terms. So it's uh, no mention of Russia. <laughs> Um, but yep. um, yeah, that's just this neutrality issue. So they j just say, well, we are good with China, we're good with the EU, why not be good that, with that both? It, that explains even more why why people want to get rid of him and get rid of this party that doesn't want to associate. I mean, imagine the, on the only thing that's greater than having a good relationship with Russia these days is having a good relationship with China. I mean, that's the one thing the neocons can't mm. stand at all. But um, then... In, in that case, it's even more interesting because what you're saying is not that that for some like altruistic reasons the go the government and Ivanishvili and so on are uh, are being are trying to to maneuver between the blocks. It's out of pure um, rational calculation and probably also like for for some profit. And the the EU approach of not even carrots and stick, but sticks and sticks, isn't helping to do that. So. Um, it has nothing to do with ideological rapprochement. It's really more like people in parliament currently thinking about what's best for them. And funnily enough, that produces an in-between kind of policy. Yeah, I mean, as a peripheral EU, EU country, like, I don't know, Bulgaria or Romania, uh, Georgia even has a lower living standard. So I don't know what kind of perspectives the EU offers them. I mean, migrant workers could come to to Germany, often they are used as uh, truck drivers or uh, picking asparagus from the fields. That's what most of the Georgians uh, do in this country here. And for the country itself, there is no strategy what kind of industry could locate there. And then China had this One Belt, One Road initiative and Georgia became part of it. Georgia is even 
one of two European states with a free trade ad agreement with China, the first one being Switzerland mm -hmm. and the second one being uh, Georgia. But in case of Georgia, with a very low uh, living standard, um, that means that the Chinese can flood the market. And um, I don't know what the Georgians export to, um, to, to China, but mostly agricultural products. I would imagine uh, maybe wine. Uh, from Moldova, they export very uh, a lot of wine <laughs> to China, but I, I'm not sure about the Georgian case. Um, yeah, and they just positioned themselves between the blocks. And there's one thing about ideology, uh, ideology um, Georgian is a very conservative country, so the Orthodox Church is uh, very strong, and they are kind of um, one way of the Russian-Georgian rapprochement and um, defending traditional values, also the fight against the LGBTQI movement. That, that's something that the, um, the Russian government promotes, and in Georgia also the Orthodox Church promotes, and that's why that could be one way of getting Russia and Georgia getting ideologically closer. Um, but most of all, um, no Georgian politician would allow, I don't know, just recognizing Russia and leaving Abkhazia and South Ossetia alone or le letting them go in their, in their perspective. They don't even have practical relations with the Abkhaz government. They just ignore them, so, um, those two statelets. There are the discussions in Geneva through the UN Avenue. The Abkhaz just downgraded their presence at these discussions because they don't have any point um, in uh, agreeing to any compromise there or there is no way to compromise there. Um, yeah, and the Georgians, they mostly care for or the Georgian Dream Party and especially Ivanishvili, they mostly care about Georgia themselves and they're not interested in, I don't know, getting part of the Eurasian Economic Union or, I don't know, the um, treaty for uh, collective security that is led by Russia. That, that's not even, I mean, that's not discussed. That's that's just not an issue. I mean, it's just more or less neutral. The Russians are very close. The, the Eurasian Economic Union is close. But from the East through Central Asia, uh, also through Russia, um, the One Belt, One World initiatives offers um, the, the Georgians many economic perspectives, mainly through infrastructure, port mm. in, new ports, um, there was a discussion to, of um, a Chinese port building, um, but then the government changed track and gave the um, <laughs> the the order to America to an American company. And the only carrot, uh, especially the Americans and the Europeans, offer are migrant visas or military help. But but that's it. But there is no economic vision or what to do with Georgia if that if Georgia would become an EU country or something, or even. Um, Clo more closely associated so in your view is which one is more important for the people or like exactly especially for the western narrative of being against this foreign agents registration law is is it to make sure that georgia doesn't pivot to russia or is it that georgia doesn't pivot to china as i hear from you now i mean this might be actually <laughs> the bigger concern now might it um yeah, I haven't seen any publications or um, strategy paper who uh, mentions China, interestingly, even though China is, uh, plays such a large role in, in the Georgian economy um, already. But um, the issue or the the picture that is painted is always that Saakashvili somehow wants uh, an authoritarian rule and then he would ally himself with Russia. And that's why this... Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, Saakashvili is in prison. No, Ivanishvili. Yes, sorry. Uh, so Ivanishvili would um, become authoritarian and then, I don't know, um, join the Eurasian Econ Economic Union and then get back to Russia or ally with Russia. That's the picture that is always painted, but uh, I don't see that coming. And But that's the most realistic fear because um, through the e Eurasian Economic Union and the other... Pro-Russia or Russian-led organizations of the post-Soviet space, and there might be some kind of framework that the Georgians mm -hmm. could join. But in the Chinese case, there is this One Belt, One Road initiative, but many states have joined that. Even mm -hmm. Italy was part of that. So that's not like like a block you would join. It's it's um, the Chinese, yeah, just abandoned the concept of leading a block or something like that. Um, so um, I think the hope would be that Georgia only 
um, concentrates on the Western integration, only exports to Western countries, only imports from Russian countries, and yeah, just gets rid of any regional integration with their neighbors and the region. Um, and that was also the, the avenue under Saakashvili. So 20 years ago, um, he came to power in, in 2003. Um, they just reoriented all of their exports to the United States, to Turkey, and also to some European countries. And all their migrant workers went to Western countries, interestingly, mostly Greece. Um, yeah, but then the world economic crisis um, hit in 2008, 2009, then the euro crisis, especially in Greece, and then these migrant wake workers came back. And yeah, there was no way for, for them to, to get to Europe or to Turkey as, as migrant workers. Mm. So they went to Russia. So it's just a, a reorientation and economic out of necessity. I mean, most of Georgian economy itself is agriculture. There's even a large part of subsistence farming. So it's uh, from an economic point of view, it's more um, close to some sub-Saharan African countries, if you, if you look at the economic structure. Um, and they just want to get the most out of it. And they get it through this middle way of being kind of neutral, uh, some slight rapprochement um, with Russia, then economic integration with the neighbors and um, big deals with the Chinese. And yeah, still this path of Euro-Atlantic integration, but not um, as, a, as, a, as the only priority. Mm. And maybe last question on this topic. Uh, what up with the president? I mean, this president now vetoed that uh, that that law. It's probably going to pass anyhow because it goes back to parliament. But who is she? Why is she in power? And why does she look like somebody who would want to sit uh, in the EU commission tomorrow? <laughs> if possible. <laughs> why does she look like a little von der Leyen? She was... I think she was even born in France and she was a French citizen until five years ago or something like that. And then she only became naturalized a Georgian citizen. But that's kind of the pro-Western avenue of the Georgian Dream Coalition. I mean, it's, it's a large coalition. The first Is she issue... also from the uh, Georgian Dream, actually? Is she part of them? She... I think she's not a party member, but she was supported by them when she got elected. Um, because they just wanted to prevent the um, Saakashvili candidate, so the uh, United National Movement candidate. Um, but she's from the larger Georgian Green Coalition, but within that coalition, she's from the Western, um, pro-Western camp, you could say. And yeah, she was um, a French citizen, but then became naturalized Georgian citizen and then um, became president. Um, but I think in the next presidential elections, the Georgian Green will just pick another um, um, presidential candidate because she got um, yeah too far away from the Georgian Dream Coalition. Um, and she, but she, she was sorry. Just to clarify, she was elected by direct vote, um, presidential. Yes. Like it's a bit like the French system, but with a weak president. Yeah, it's a it's a far weaker president. So it's not yeah. a presidential system; it's a parliamentary system. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but she got elected um, by the by the people. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, and where do you put her in terms of um, influence over uh, uh, over Georgian foreign policy? She she's largely ceremonial in the sense that she can't really block parliamentary decisions, right? Yes, she can't block it. I mean, she blocked now the transparency law or the foreign agents law. I think the the current title is uh, more like transparency law. Um, but that goes back to the parliament, and then with a with a simple majority, they can override it. But she has her own foreign policy. She went to all the EU capitals, met with the German president and with other leading EU politicians. And normally, she would have to coordinate that with the government, but she didn't. So there was even a constitutional crisis last year, and because the Georgian government says so, the prime minister, especially the then prime minister. Um, said that you have to coordinate your foreign policy efforts, but she just makes her own foreign policy because she just aligned with the pro-Western camp or pro-Sakashvili camp or pro-exclusively um, Euro-Atlantic camp. And um, yeah, there was kind of this a constitutional crisis. And now she yeah she tries to rally support in, uh, in the Western European um, capitals. Um, but I don't know how popular she is. I don't know if there are any polls and how um, how it would look like if she if there would be a, a snap presidential election. I'm really not sure.
So the thing is, at the moment, in order for the pro-Western side to win, what they need to make sure is that they can somehow circumvent the elected majority in parliament and are not sub, um, um, subject to another to another um, uh, somehow vote because they would be. It's pretty clear that they would be voted out. So at the moment, what you want is a, is a kind of a second Maidan in Georgia in order to overthrow a government and put a caretaker government in. That's that's. But that's about as far as it goes. Is it? I mean, that's the only realistic option for Saakashvili and his his allies on the streets, but also in opposition. And as we have seen in Ukraine, um, the Party of Regions by Yanukovych was also a coalition of several business interests. And just when Yanuko uh, Yan Yanukovych fled, then this coalition broke apart and never um, reunified again. And so I don't know if there would be some storming of parliament and I don't know, the, the prime minister flees then maybe some new coalition could emerge and then even the um, the opposition together with the president could arrange a new ma majority. But I don't know if there are any plans like that or any hints, but um, Western European politicians demonstrating on the streets with opposition politicians, it's, I mean, the images are similar to Maidan or even the Orange Revolution or something like that. But I don't know if, um, yeah, if there's any effort um, by Western interests to try that because there, there would only always be the fear of either a Belarusian like crackdown on the one hand or some kind of, I don't know, Russian meddling. I don't know. I mean, they're very, very close. I mean, they don't have relations with Georgia, but um, if close to um, with his back on his wall, uh, Ivanishvili will turn to Russia and then just invite, I don't know, some uh, eternal uh, security troops from Russia or something like that. I mean, that could change quickly, but um, yeah. I'm not sure if there are any plans like that, like a second Maidan or a Georgian Maidan.